Let us just close our eyes and see if we can uh, experience what we describe it to represent. <coughs> technique is very simple. It's been given to you over the centuries. And when the eyes are single, that's the pure eyes you have in your head. And the only way they can be single, you have to close them. And then you're inside your own biological TV set. And early men didn't have lights after six o'clock. So he was forced to sit down and look inside of his head to entertain himself and find out what he is. So the instruction was, and the eyes are single, the whole body, that's the container you're in, is full of light. That is the elements or atoms that compose you are in a state of kinetic ignition but you don't comprehend it way back from the dawn of time to now, we're still worrying about what's going on inside our skin. But if you see the light inside of your own skin, it's shining already inside there, and you don't know why, because your intellect can't tell you why it's supposed to be shining. And the skin is called darkness. The light is shining in the darkness, darkness of the skin. But let your light so shine, that means watch it, observe it, it's you. That's what you actually are inside of your own cellular structure, an atom glowing, totally unaware externally of it going on internally of you. <coughs> As you observe it more and more and don't analyze it because there's no way to analyze your own internal structure. And they say let your light so shine that means the length of time you spend looking at it and shine before men, not animals or birds or trees. Other human beings who will see it radiating out through your skin and recognize that something is going on inside of you that you're conscious of that they may not be conscious of. And if you observe it more, this light will glow that those who look at it and see it glowing through your skin, they would be the first one to recognize some creative power holding you together. So they say, let your light so shine before men that they may see the good works. That's the length of time you spent to sit down and look at it. It sounds kind of simple, but it's very difficult to do. And glorify the Father which is in you. That's the creative principle and resident in your structure as the atomic makeup of your mass. And then it allows you to live the illusion you can talk to yourself and pray to the invisible light within yourself. It's kind of strange way, but that's exactly what you're doing until you come to grips with it. Now, there 
There's only one commandment in there. Don't fall asleep on the job. <coughs> Anything you do in the process, watch it. Don't analyze it. But don't fall asleep on the job.
Now partially open the eyes, not completely. In the two states of conscious and subconscious, just let the eyes be partially open. Feel the body breathing through the skin. Now completely open the eyes, but don't move. Thank you. As I said before, <coughs> you have a choice of asking lots of questions tonight pertaining what is involved in meditation. We'll try and see if we can answer your questions. So, here's your chance to explore what you think it is. So, you say you shouldn't fall asleep. How does one not? How does one learn how not to fall asleep? That's self-observation. There is no self. You can't show me self, but you can show me cell. And you can observe the cell by breathing. It takes oxygen to allow the cell to be conscious. And if you breathe, and you're conscious, the brain allows you to stay alert. You call it wakefulness. The early religion would say you are in spiritual vigilance. You are a witness. And they give you all labels simply for what? Spend the time to watch yourself breathe that you don't fall asleep in order to perceive 
the atomic structure in your cell called light. But if you fall asleep, the worst that can happen to you is you go into oblivion. And you may not know if you're a man or a woman when you're in that state. You may be lucky if you wake up. That is, providing that principle don't unplug you when you fell asleep and you were unconscious and don't know if you're a man or a woman. But you broke the commandment because you stopped loving the creative intelligence God with all of the mind. Part of it shut down and the other part went out dreaming. But if you do stay alert and you fight the frustration and the dizziness and the, all the fuzziness of getting tired, you may break out into an unusual internal observation of what you are. And that's the real test. Now, if you don't panic, if you fall asleep, you may wake up, or you may not wake up. You don't know. But if you don't know when you're sound asleep, if you're a man or a woman, you certainly don't know what you are if you don't wake up. <coughs> but you can live every kind of illusion. With the electrical field. But you'll be locked into your own geometrical fixation before you shut down. And after you do succeed to wake up, you notice a strange thing. You told yourself to wake up the night before. Didn't you tell yourself you're going to wake up today to go to work? So you plan your own what continuance by talking to yourself before you went to bed last night. Right or wrong? So that was the most unique prayer you ever used. <laughs> but you don't realize it. Or when you woke up, you give thanks. Hmm. Take another breath. Get on the job, clean up the house, take care of the place. And that's what we're constantly doing in our cellular structure, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, till we come to grips with what we are. And the test is very simple. Don't fall asleep. And that's where Brother Jesus told his own students. And when he found them sleeping, he chastised them. But he didn't chastise them for no other problem. There's nothing here in this universe to be chastised for other than falling asleep on the job. But you will be given many more opportunities to continue to pass the test in another body if you don't wake up and they have to bury you. And if you wake up, you feel crummy about the fact that you fell asleep on the job, try again. You're still lucky they didn't unplug you. And to him that overcome it, that's the sleep state, you know. Nothing else. I, the principle created within you, will not send you forth again. That's your intellect to play the game between sleep and no sleep. But will make you, your cellular structure, composed of atoms, a permanent fixture in this universe. It's very simple, factual, scientifically valid, but the test is the most unusual one. Don't fall asleep on the job.
There's no church. There's no God sitting on a throne waiting for dead people. The God has already become his creation, presenting the biggest test to his creation, seeing if it will fall asleep on the job. But if it wakes up and stay alert, we call that what? Jehovah's Witness? Or in tune with God? Ever conscious with God? God realization? Or loving God with all your mind? Now you can't love it part of the mind and sleep. That'll be really breaking the commandment, right? So you see how simple the thing is and how it was never presented to us that we could cope with it until we meant many, many mistakes, but they're valid <coughs> and are necessary to bring you to where you are right now. And that does not exclude me. I'm included. I'm stuck in the job. If I fall asleep in the job, they can unplug me too. If I'm awake, then I'm entitled to the process and the results. So staying awake is your biggest challenge. But you know something? When you fall asleep, you have a tendency to do what? Breathe fast or slow? Now, <clears throat> that will tell you right away, a breath-free person will never make it. You ever met breath-free people? They live in the grave, right? <laughs> but I sure met a lot of breathless ones. And so the slower you breathe, you're called breathless. And the more you can control the breath, that's why it's given to you as a gift. When the cord was cut, and if you stay on time, they keep you. If you don't stay on time, they throw you back in the dirt. Too simple, too factual, but that's the name of the game. Breathlessness is a form of conscious regulation, observation of your true nature. Breath free, no such deal. So all the wise men throughout the centuries have all come to the same realization and put it in simple language to tell us, but we may not realize it until we have to go through it. As Paul has said, <laughs> I live and die daily in the Lord. That means I breathe in and out every second. And if you don't breathe in, you don't breathe out, it's over. And the Eastern people try to teach you breath control, which means breathless state <coughs> by being aware of it as the bridge between conscious and unconsciousness in yourself. If you become unconscious and you don't wake up, it's over. But nature, God, creative principle, will provide you another opportunity simply because you're made of elements. And elements don't have a right to kill nobody, but they have a right to harass every creation or form they find themselves in. And they'll provide every opportunity for you to muck it up. So even Brother Lazarus couldn't stay in the grave, he was told to get out. <laughs> My brother Jesus, come on, get the heck out of the place. <laughs> Start living again. You have to come out. He's made of elements. You have to breed. You have to come out. <clears throat> so, when we don't feel that we are accepted by the creative intelligence, that's very self-destructive, and then we find our breathing begins to slow down, and there we are heading to breath-free state. 
But if you know that the creative intelligence gave you breath as an opportunity to discover the true you, then grab the ball like Brother Sinatra and go it your way. Do it your way because there ain't nobody gonna breathe for you. Years ago, I fell off a building and I smashed up my body and there was all the great saints, but not one of them would breathe for me, but everyone spoke one word with their eyes, not with their mouth, breathe. Breathe, what's that for? I came to see you guys, I want to see God. <laughs> breathe. And after a while, you learned the lesson that they knew what they were doing and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> so when I accepted the confrontation that the breath is the key, like the key to the car to turn the ignition to go down the road, then I knew I was a driver, not a passenger no more of my own vehicle. Pick up your cross and follow me. Don't pick up mine, says Jesus. Your own vehicle, your own cross is right here, but it's the greatest thing you got. And meditation is a quick way to find out how important it is. Prayer will fool you, but prayer is good. Prayer is for the passenger. Meditation is for the driver. That's how we separate the two. The passenger from the driver. Yes? Huh? Can you give me a little, describe me a little more what the difference is between prayer and meditation? Prayer is repeating a phrase verbally to yourself or to the air around you to convince your subconscious mind to stick it out. And if somebody's in the sky listening to you, <laughs> they wonder what the heck you say to yourself, but they will satisfy you because you're made of elements and the elements are around you as your environment and they provide every opportunity for you to live out the prayer till you find out that you can't own it, whatever you pray for. You can't own your breath. Great as the richest man in the world, when he stops breathing, he finds that he can't own nothing and he's just as poor as the other one who would think he's poor and then had nothing. Breathing is the key. And prayer can enforce you, reinforce you, make you do a lot of things with your mind frame. But it's not meditation. Meditation is you have to come to grips with your atomic structure and relive a factual reality about how you were put together. Prayer doesn't do that. No amount of prayer will make you relive the journey of the sperm to the ovum. And you are a composite of that. You're not a composite of two sperms or two ovums. You may not like it, but we're stuck with it. And meditation is driving your own car. Getting to know your mechanics of yourself. So when you come to grips, by looking inside, and the technique is simple, that's why it's not a prayer. When the eyes are single, that's not a prayer. The whole body is full of light, atomic structure, cellular mass. And it's shining in the darkness. It ain't waiting for you to go find it. It's there already waiting for you to wake up to it. And let your light so shine before men, not before dog or cat or trees or birds, but other human beings who are still searching for what they are instead of who they are, that they may see the good work. That's the length of time you spent to relive the journey of the sperm to the ovum, which is enlightenment. Enlightenment is not intelligence or wisdom or knowing more than the other guy. Enlightenment is the act of realizing you're a sperm and an ovum bodied together by an atomic principle. And then you are master, 
Nobody's your master. You are the master. You are the driver of that vehicle once and for all. Like it or not. But when you master it, not a single element in this universe cannot disobey you. Everyone has to obey you. But you can't own not one of them. You have the power in the resonance of the voice called the word. You are the temple, tissue, containing elements. You got to validate your own reality of the journey that you made as a sperm to know him. And losers can be born. Look around the room. Our only winners are here, but you can make yourself a loser calling yourself anything after you're born. So, what you're trying to realize about yourself, that when you make that journey back inside of yourself and relive it, you'll run through many different experiences inside, not realizing what they represent until you live it. And when you finish live it, and then you have the facts to work with for the first time. Free men all, lord of their cells. Not their self, there's no self. Lord of the cell. Now you know electricity, uh, in a, by a battery, what do you call them? Five cell battery, three cell battery. <laughs> they call them cells, right? And this is the most fantastic battery. Until you realize what it is, then you got all the power going inside of you. But this here is a red cell battery. This is not a dry cell battery. That's what's so unique about this one. And it's set up in a polarity too, like every battery. And we can't invent a single thing and call it an invention that cannot be identified inside the body. It can be found inside the body first, existing there, waiting for it to be expressed externally. So, many people want realization. They want enlightenment. But they build every kind of illusions as to what it represents until they have to face it. And then they find out what it does represent. And what it can do is fantastically different than what they expect. God is and always will be unanticipated, unrehearsed, ever new opportunity. Not male nor female but the principle that sustains form or geometry to allow it to talk to itself. And we, as form or geometry, were put together without our consent. Did your daddy ask you, as a sperm, when he released you down the uterine canal to go be a winner? <laughs> Interesting phenomenon, eh? But that's the facts we have to live with. And it's the greatest truth. Until we relive the experience, we don't have any enlightenment. And the wise men know that. They don't tell you anything that is not possible to live. Everything they tell us are possible when we understand what they're saying. So if you pray, what are you praying for? Somebody's problems or your own problems? If you meditate, do you have problems or you have freedom? Okay. Adana, you're talking a lot about you know, the end of meditation, what meditation is supposed to lead to. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I'm a guy who sits down, and I close my eyes, I try to think of a light, you know, all these thoughts come rushing in, and I'm trying to handle things like that. What do you do to get rid of the thoughts? It sounds like you're just talking about breathing or just being aware of breath, and these other things that you're talking about will come. Am I hearing you correctly when you're, what you're saying? You don't have a single thing to do than to watch. Can you do that? It's very difficult. I know. Whenever well, you got a movie house, do you tell the screen how to run the show? No. Or why do you sit down and watch it? Because you pay the money, and so you sit down to be entertained. Right? Does a Dracula ever get off the screen and bite you? <coughs> and that's the same thing going on inside of your cellular structure. It's called witness in the olden days. Modern man is only calling it what? <coughs> Conscious observation or concentration or focusing. No analysis is required. But what is required is one of the toughest things to do is to sit down and watch it. But if you can stick it out, that's why they said to him that overcome it. Whoever can stick it out, male or female, right up to the point where you relive the journey of the sperm and ovum bonding inside of you, you are free man, woman, lord of the cell. But it takes a heck of a long time to sit down and watch it. Some people do it in 18 years. That's the minimum time allotted to man. The maximum time is 95 years. But he will make it if he stick it out. So there are three periods in your life when you can make it if you stick it out. From 1 to 35. Brother Jesus did it in 30. Or from 45 to 65. That's the second period. So we go between 1 to 65. Or 85 to 95. If you make it by 95 and they bury you, you start over again. But between the three periods of Saturn return, Big Daddy O has lined it up for you to master it. So you ain't got a single thing to do. As Brother Jesus says, I of myself can do nothing. I of myself can do a dog hunting. But the Father in me does everything. And all I got to do is watch. Well, you know, that's a tough thing to do. To watch and don't try to analyze. That's the toughest job there is. So close your eyes and watch. Because your brain is so programmed to the environment that it'll find every way to talk to itself to avoid not watching. Isn't that true? So they call it the devil in the olden days. I've never met him. But the biggest devil is distraction from watching. So every geometrical illusion <coughs> will come up to confront you, to distract you from watching. But if you can watch and don't get stressed out, you will master it. And then you are your own master. Nobody's your master. After you master it, you'll be in this world and not of the world. Like Krishna says, to be in the world, but not of the world. Most people think to be in the WORLD and not in the WRLD. He is saying to be in the WORLD, but not in the WHIRL of it. That's a big difference when you understand what they're talking. To live in this world of this universe as a form, but not caught up in the world of the geometries of it. Then you're free in your cellular structure and you can move through time and space at will in your own cosmic geometry. There's nothing to show off, but it's there for those to experience. We have enough evidence of the 24 qualities that are given to us if we overcome the watching and not getting trapped in the analysis. When we watch 
and I keep watching till we master it. There are 24 qualities or gifts. Three are recorded by man already. That is a non-decomposing mechanism if you want to shut it down, leave the world to play around with it. Two, to take it with you and leave them wondering where the hair you went, because they got no evidence you've ever been here. Or three, you can drop in now and then and visit with your brothers and sisters, eat some food, and they can't photograph you. And there are others more that you call superman tricks, but they're there. And they are with you all the time till you master it. And they're not going to go away. Every belief system have had enough experiences of it already. There's not a single belief system on this planet that didn't have a, a living model of those basic three already. The other 21, it looks like something like science fiction. But every belief system have had and will continue to have models of the first three. Non-decomposing mechanism like a butterfly <coughs> is already there before you came on the planet. Uh, not able to keep the body, you'll take off and go away. Or drop in on the photograph, you can't photograph it. And it'll eat and be touched and satisfy every feeling and take off. But it wouldn't use you in any way, shape, and form to make you feel stupid. It'll only be there to reinforce your willingness to stick it out, to watch the internal journey. And that's what they'll always do. And they'll constantly remind you, you got to do it, they can't do it for you. But they'll be present to reinforce your confidence so that you don't panic and shut down. In my case, it's the same. They cannot do it for me, I got to do it for myself. So. That's the essence of it. But the technique is very simple. It'll be here till midnight eternity. When the eyes are single, the whole body is full of light. Atomic structure. No philosophy, no churchianity. Total cosmic physics. Total God. Not a God. This is the living temple living because it's the only way elements can move around in a form called manifestation or man, tissue, male or female, no other way. And it's of no asset to a dog or a cat or a tree. It's an asset to another living man or woman to reinforce the reality within it. When someone is struck by lightning then and they survive, uh, why or how can you relate that to changing the structure? Why do you have that affect us then? Do you, have, do you think that makes changes or does not make changes? Or what is it doing to fit in with the overall? It could be worse. No, I'm saying does, I know. does it you alter the structure that we came in? It don't alter your structure. You have enough atoms in your body to run ten suns. No ten suns? There's only one there up in the sky. It's burning out in a few more million uh, years from now. It'll be all ashes. In the meantime, not only explode and go on, but your body <coughs> has the equivalent 
of ten of them. So one little lightning ain't doing much to you after a while, as you begin to realize, unless you're toxic. If you're toxic and it hits you at a certain angle, then it can burn you in a bad situation. But if you're not toxic, you'll survive it coming out looking, smelling like a rose. And smelling roses. There are a lot of people who have been hit by it and haven't had no serious damage done to them. Plus those who have been hit by it and have serious damage done to them simply because of their toxicity. And the toxicity is the condition that the wise men have written down for centuries ago. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I say cleanliness is godliness. Clean up your act. Don't fool yourselves. You may fool yourself, but not yourselves. They'll let you down, let you know for sure how foolish you are until you clean them up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? what, what changes as the consciousness is altered as you go toward that ultimate realization? Very rarely does it seem people just boom there. Um, it's there, I realize you're there, but you don't realize you're there. But aren't there alterations of consciousness along the line? And what causes that? When you don't know where you're going, you're looking for alterations. <laughs> when you know where you're going, you're bug, they don't bug you. Okay. So first find out where you're going. You're going back. You weren't told where you were going back, but you were told to go back. Seek ye first the kingdom of God which is within you. It is outside of you. It told you where to go, but it didn't tell you what to look for. <laughs> so it's inside. And it's righteousness, how it operates. That's how this structure is put together. And it will free you. That means you'll get rid of all your so-called diversifications of your mind frame. Free men are a lot of themselves, of the self. So the actual journey is a reliving of a structural memory imprinted in your DNAs and RNAs and in your silicon carbon chips. The journey of the sperm to the ovum in the present form. You've had many forms before. They shut down and went to sleep. And somebody unplugged you. <laughs> but you know now what not to do. Don't fall asleep on the job. Otherwise, you aren't loving the Lord with all your mind, all your heart, all your strength, and all your soul. But you don't have a soul to save with your body. That's kind of preposterous. You are soul or living soil meaning your dynamic atoms in a cellular structure. <clears throat> the epitome of God walking on his own creation, waiting for it to wake up to accept its reality. But when it does do that, it's a glory to the God. And greater things shall you do, your brother said, not lesser things. So the greater thing is get back to what you are. Then you have the whole cosmos to live in but they're throwing it right in our face. And it'll be thrown to us back and forth till we live up to it. So any mind game away from what you're going to would constantly be there to harass you till you realize you don't need those harassment. You know where you're going. You're going to relive the actual memory of the bonding of the sperm with the ovum. And that's the ignition, like the key in the car. And you see the whole atomic structure, how it's put together. And then you will be present to observe a strange phenomenon. And it'll sound like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwells in man, not donkey or trees. And then you realize how you goof, because you didn't know it was that simple. But the moment you realize it, that it was that simple, you say, what took you so long to get back there? <laughs> 
And that's the essence of meditation. Meditation is the ancient man's way to get back to himself, right? I'm wondering, do you think there's a point in time where the, the spirit enters that bonding, or what is your belief about that? Years ago, I might just say, I believe. Today, I don't believe. I'm more hard-headed than Thomas. You know Thomas? You read of him. Now you're looking at a hard-headed guy who when I was given my title as a realized Swami, they couldn't pick a better name than Nityananda, hard-headed nitty-gritty. <laughs> because I don't believe. I either know or I don't know. And if I know, then what I know must work. And if it does work, it must be very simple and very practical. And it can be found in any religious text. But it's so hidden in the language structure of it, you would miss it if you didn't understand it. So. The structure of your mechanism is very simple. Applies to everybody. You do not breathe through your nostrils. When you are in the womb, you're attached to your mother as an overgrown tumor called fetus. You may make every kind of yell or cry, and they may think you're very conscious, only to find out you ain't. Until they cut that cord, and the two valves in your nostrils open up on its own, and it's synchronized to the pressure of the air with the oxygen from the environment, you ain't nobody other than an extended fetus thrown off by mama. That's the fact. Now, if you hold the air on time like a synchronized carburetor, you're going to run the machinery on your own individuality. And individuality is the label they gave centuries ago as spirit. If you don't breed, what are you going to do with the body? And what do you breathe in? Not spirit, you breathe in oxygen. So every device is developed today to see if they can keep that oxygen going in your nostril. And if it stays in, fine, they keep you. You don't want to stay in, bungo, back in the ground. Dust you are and dust you go. Sounds familiar? But it's too factual. We got a lot of illusions about what this is <coughs> versus what it actually is and what it can really do. Our illusions are so high, but this is greater than the illusion, far more superior than the illusion, if you understand what it can and does do. The oxygen enters you when they cut the cord through the nostril. And you are kept in your environment to be programmed by it. The only one problem with it is this. We are born as a baby to be programmed by our parents who must pay the rent for 18 years from the time you come out. And then after 18 years, if you don't respond to what they say, they're gonna put you away in a little place till you learn the lessons or they may confine you as an incapable individual to cope with your environment. But if you do respond, you're a very efficient computer, right? You're very functional and you're not making mistakes and you're doing everything you're told to do. So you're very obedient. This is the way it is set up. We may not like it. Evolving from one to a hundred to be programmed by the environment to be told what to do in order to function, to survive. But let's reverse the process. Two young people, 16 years of age, got pregnant, and the baby comes out. And he's 100 years old. He says, hi, Mom, I'm Captain J34 from Jupiter. I've just landed my craft, and now I've had to take a fast trip. What do you think now? And I'm ready to get back over. Ta-da. What the heck are you going to do now? <laughs> you see what I mean? But it can't work that way. <laughs> it won't be practical <laughs> in this planetary system. So we are forced to go through 
the biological charade of having a little kid coming out one year old already when he's in the womb. You know, it takes a year. Most people don't count that. They think it's a year after he lived. But it's a year already he come out. <laughs> You've been carrying him there for nine months plus the three months of the daddy. So here you are. But we got to program it. So that's one of the anguish. But it's very important because that's how the script is set up. In order for us to develop two important things. One, compassion. Two, patience. We wouldn't develop those two and our immunity will phase off. Because of the stress and the anguish put upon us, it generates more immunity in us. As I was saying to some friends, picture for one moment, the child is saying, my parents are lousy parents, they treat me very bad and I grow up now and I sure hate the heck out of them. And then the parents go on cosmic vacation. And when they get up to meet Big Daddy O, Daddy Dio says, Hi, boys and girls. How did you like being lousy parents? Did you like the role that we gave you, playing lousy parents down there on planet Earth? <coughs> Meantime, the kiddies are down there, and their time will come up now. When they come up, and they see Daddy-O and Mommy-O sitting next to Big Daddy, laughing all the time. Where the heck? They are lousy pairs. Aha, uh -huh, that's what you think. The roles are not the principle. The principle is here to learn how to cope with roles. And you know the principle? If you take the breath and you synchronize to it, you can play the role. But if you don't take the breath and synchronize, you can't play no role. And that's what they call spirit in the olden days. Today we call it the conscious vital function of a living organism, breath of life. But the funny joke about the thing, it's a gift. You can't breathe it in on your own if you try even to cut the cord. You know that? <coughs> They've tried to cut the cord, and the baby doesn't take it in on its own. It's pushed in to open those valves. That means a certain pressurization has to occur. That's why. Have you ever heard or seen a blue baby when it's born? That's blue because it don't take no oxygen and it can't take oxygen. And the oxygen doesn't go. So they have to put it under a light then in time it will respond to the light and then the oxygen will work its way through. They call them blue babies or they're suffering from a disease called bilirubin. But they know with on all doubt you don't pull the air in. It's pushed into you. Therefore you're the recipient. Like I pour water into this container. And that makes you as a physical form to the creative environment. You're indebted to it because the gift of breath has been put into you to allow you to function as an individual. We may not like it, but we are stuck in it. And so Brother Jesus will come along and say to you, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We know what is Caesar or Mr. Bush, that's income tax. Or rent unto God what is God's. And then you ask, what the heck belong to God? And then you find out you owe him income breath. And you don't take the income breath, they can bury you because that's the end of the movie. You get it? And if you breed, you ain't doing it on your own. That's why Brother Jesus will tell you, I am myself can't do a dog or thing. But the father and me doing everything. That breath that is inside of me was pushed into me to make me feel what? Dependent upon it in order to what? Feel humble enough to cry out every day, give me more. And if I don't get any more, ta-ta, start all over Adano, play somewhere else. And that's exactly why we are like that. But it's to teach 
a unique principle of love. A love that cannot be compared. The fact that you're put together by a principle may depend upon it to survive in order to function. A love that allows this process to occur has built its own warranty love. You know what warranty love? You know whether you buy something and they give you a warranty? In case it breaks down, you cannot go back and confront the people, right? That's the same with this one. You got warranty love built into it, but you don't know it. Some people call it grace, or making it by the skin of your nose. Yeah. So your, your breath is pushed into you. That's right. Because when you try to meditate or concentrate on the breath, you watch it come in and go out, you kind of think, what's causing it to the timing? You try to find the source. So you're saying even from the baby, first breath wasn't a willful act. That's right. It was a gift pushed in. Correct. And that's the way it is even now the yeah. next breath. That's right. All you can do to it is slow it down between the inhalation and the exhalation. But if it starts to fumble and you're gasping, they'll try to give you CPR to try to stabilize it. And if it doesn't stabilize, that's where it's, it ends again. An external source makes you dependent upon it. There is no internal source sustaining it. No container can fill itself unless somebody pick it up to dip with it, right? There's a lot of contradiction then. The kingdom of heaven is within you and this, ex ah. this external source is pushing you. Ah, heaven or heaven is inside of you, yes. Also, uh, it's outside of you as the very same thing that contains you. Where would you exist as a container? The skin that you got that makes this container on the outside, it, is there any oxygen there? Yeah, right here. No oxygen? And the one inside here is more or less than the one outside? Yeah? Same. So where are you now? Hmm? Think of it, where are you? Peel the skin off of a skeleton, what you'll find. The best skeleton that don't breed, we can do it. All the parts are perfect, they say, at the research lab, but the mechanism don't breed, sir. And they try to put the air in to make it breed, but it don't hold. What do we do now? Put it into the soil, or we cremate it, or whatever way we want to dispose of it so we don't have any way to what? Feel threatened by it. But even if you leave it in the soil or outside, it's going to go through a process called decomposition. It will decompose itself because no oxygen is there to what? sustain it. And yet the oxygen is outside, inside, but it don't, what, synchronize. See? It don't synchronize. If it synchronize, then they'll hold. Now, your nose may not seem important to you, But think, from the day you started to breed, after the cord was cut to right now, all the verbs and adjectives and pronouns and nouns that you remember, which one of them will replace your nose? And if the air gets toxic, that's where we can't use it, that's the oxygen now. 
no letter of an alphabet or no number of a numeral is going to what? Make it better for the nose to do what? Use it. Now we don't realize in our galactic system as a planet we're the most highly populated planet there is, you know, planet Earth. All the others don't even have. I don't think any more than a couple million if there is on them. And yet we got over five billion walking around and they're taking it for granted they're going to be here. The planet sun is burning out. It ain't uh, something that's shining like it's an object that exploded millions of years ago and it's slowly burning itself out. Just this one little galaxy we live in. Don't, forget, don't worry about the rest, this one. We don't even realize what is going on around us. But we take everything because somebody is saying, do this, do that, you're going to go to heaven. And when you arrive there, what do you find? You got misled. Ask yourself with all honesty, if you were God, would you sit down and wait for a dead person? <laughs> huh? Would you sit down on a throne and wait for a dead person to show up if you're God? When you make life or you give life? What are you going to do with a dead person? That's common sense after a while. You know, I studied to be a priest and I had to be very dogmatic too. But there comes a day when I asked my preceptor, I said, look, this don't make sense. I'm praying here every night and day. Um, what? You mean to tell me God's going to sit down and wait for me until I die? Are you supposed to be the giver of life? What would I want more from him than to live more? Would you want to live more if you're dying? Common sense will tell you after a while, what do you want more? More breath, right? So after a while you begin to see this whole thing is uh, written in a different way. Not that what we think it's supposed to mean. But every church, I don't know if you ever see them, they have a big sign outside open for prayer and the word is big you know prayer and in the bottom corner and meditation you ever see that i used to grow up and have to work with them <coughs> you know, the catholic boy <laughs> little word meditation and if you ask father what's that oh that's not for you son <laughs> <laughs> he was telling me i'm too young to be a driver yet <laughs> but most of these men live a dual life in the monastery the outward life to present to the, the world the ritual and to reinforce encourage but in their own makeup many of them were highly evolved beings that knew what the purpose of it was all about but they could not tell you and would not tell you you had to run into it or bump into it the hard way so that's how I came into it. I came to it the hard way. I fell off a building, I smashed up my body, and then I learned the hard way. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't pursue your lifestyle or what you believe in, but there comes a time when belief parts company and knowing must be experienced. Yeah. Is there a positive function for sleep? A what function? A positive function for sleep. If it's, if it's an escape or you might die in your sleep, so don't go to sleep. Is, what, is there a positive function? Well, I'm going to answer you like I had to answer it years ago, and I was forced into answering it when I asked the same question. And I was told the answer, yes, no, maybe. <coughs> Well, that's a way to transition without a lot of pain. <laughs> the person said to me, when I asked the same question, and they replied, yes, no, maybe. All three answers are valid, providing which time frame you function from. Now, if you want to function as a child, it's valid for you to sleep. 
and continue to be a passenger in life, it's valid for you to sleep. But if you want to function as a, an adult and a driver of your own vehicle, that's rule number one, you don't break. No, you don't sleep. Now, you may think I'm joking. No, I don't think you are. I've been subjected to every test, and I got lots of friends who made every trick test on me, only to end up falling asleep and sleeping for days, and I'm sitting down laughing at them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, several years ago, I was met at an airport by a wonderful gentleman. He said, Adano, you're going to be my guest today. Eight and we was at his house. Fine. I arrived, and there were all a lot of people there, and he began asking me questions about meditation and everything. But I noticed in a strange way, two other guys, professionally looking, but they were sleeping on the floor. And all the others were listening to what I was talking. After eight hours, my host decided to go into the back room. And then I said, uh-oh, I suspect something is going to happen. I'll, I'll go along. One of the guys who was lying on sleeping woke up and started asking questions. For straight eight hours, too. <laughs> and that's 16 hours, right? I just came off a plane and did question. And then again, he took off to go to the back room. And by that time, the third guy got up, and he's going to ask me questions. Now, he ran his questions for another eight hours. So when I look at the clock and I'm laughing, I says, well, I know what they're trying to find out. If I really sleep or I don't sleep, well, I can give them a run for the money. <laughs> So I, I stayed there and I just normally relax and let the flow of the thing work, <laughs> knowing what the, the whole process is scientifically. And after three days, they were all conked out there, and their wives are telling me, Adato, what the heck you did to my husbands? <laughs> I said, they wanted to find out if I slept or not. They pulled every trick in the book, but it didn't work. <laughs> I said, it isn't, I'm talking just a soft way. I had to go through these things the hard way, and that's why when I talk of it, if I, I didn't go through it, I wouldn't work with it. That was the way I came into it. And I met a wonderful men in this world, and they're great. Each one are masters of themselves. But they're not my master, and they'll tell me they're not my master. But they'll tell me to master myself. <laughs> so sleep state is valid if you want to be a passenger. If you're a young boy going to school and your parents are paying the rent for 18 years, and that's what they call them, pay rent, <laughs> don't you ever disobey them. <laughs> you obey them for those 18 years required by the law, and then when you get your driver's license, you can do your own thing. But 18 years is fine to sleep. The next 12 years, I call it the Chinese calendar. So it makes 18 and 12 is 30. Chinese calendar starts off with the year of the rat and ends with the year of the pig. And each year in the 12 has a sign representing some animal. And so if you make 30 years and you, by that time you'll decide if you want to sleep or not to sleep. <coughs> but if you decide not to sleep, Saturn will come in and smack you. That's Mother Nature's uh, disciplinarian in your horoscope or the scope of the horror or your cross. And you're gonna pick it up. And she can lay it out right on the line to make you realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe I jumped the gun too fast. Or I'm pushed into the realization. Well, if you're pushed into it, you'll realize it sooner or later. A sudden condition is appearing in you. A craving for sleep is disappearing. Lesser and lesser desire for it. If you do, master it, you'll notice you don't crave it, and then the body will do a strange phenomenon. It starts to regenerate itself spontaneously without sleep. Because you program yourself to sleep in the womb simply because you chose the carbon-based body to stay in the womb 
for nine months and to come out to be nursed by mom and to sleep till you grow up, that programming is running out. Now, if you were a silicon body, hook up by a sperm and ovum in 24 hours, standing straight up, full grown, what sleeping do you need? What fetus do you need? But we've been there before, so we have to confront it sometime. But we are in a carbon-based body, where we are put into a state where all these laws are turned down, not turned off, for us to relive it and to go through the process of wanting to sleep and then not to sleep. And then to master the state of spontaneous cellular rejuvenation. Your body, strange as it may seem to you, totally unaware, regenerates itself 10 minutes every hour. So a total of 24 hours, taking 10 minutes out of each hour, you'll have how many minutes of regeneration allotted to your body? Two hours and 40 minutes, right? Or 20 minutes? Hmm? Good. Two, hour, uh, two hours and 20 minutes, right? 10 minutes to, to an hour. You have 24 hours. Good. All right. So how much you got now? Ten minutes to the hour. Twenty-four hours. How many minutes you got? Two hours and forty minutes, right? Two hours and forty minutes. That's two hours or four hours. Four hours and four hours and twenty minutes. It's sixty minutes to an hour. You have two hours and forty minutes. Four times six. See? Four hours. It's just four hours even. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now you got the picture clear again. You got four hours even, right? Yeah. Well, astronomers weren't kings, you know. They walk around looking for Brother Jesus. It was astrologers that were kings walking around looking for Brother Jesus. But they better be smart astrologers. Otherwise, Aunt Jones or Brother James would have taken away their throne. So they don't walk away from the throne and leave the family there behind their back. They knew what they were doing. And so the laws of physics backs them up today. Within those four hours, you have the frequencies set up in your body in which one you came in. Were you born in a fire frequency, an air frequency, a water frequency, or an earth frequency? You know it as Aries, it is a fire sign, right? You know Taurus is an earth sign, right? And you know uh, Gemini is an air sign, and you know Cancer is a water sign. And each one of you is subjected to it. Pick up your cross and follow me. <laughs> I can't do it for you. You gotta do your own energy, but it's there locked into you, and it will revitalize you as long as you understand how to work with it. Your own body is built to regenerate you without sleep. Is no. the same thing for the food? Yeah. Are all realized masters the same way that none of you sleep? That's right. Now, if a master is sleeping, he ain't realized. Oh, yeah. But how does, how does it, uh, you know, you, you know that this is it, and then what do you do? Just keep meditating until... Uh, you will uh, eventually experience the no sleep state as a result. But if you're looking for uh, more backup evidence, there's a book called The Razor's Edge. Anybody ever read it? No, yes. Uh, the guy who went to Tibet, and he was told to go test himself to find out if he's ready to, for enlightenment. 
So he went up in the mountain and he carried some books. He spent all night reading it, and then he's about to fall asleep. But he didn't have enough fire to keep him warm, so he had to choose between burning the books to stay alive or fall asleep and die. You know what he did? He burned the books to stay alive and didn't fall asleep and woke up. He didn't wake up because he was wide awake and he saw the star go away, the moon was gone, and the bright sun there and the birds flying. And he realized he had mastered what? Sleep. So he turned around to go back to the temple. And to his amazement, the Lama in charge of the temple is standing at the door waiting for him like that. Well, I see you have mastered yourself. You no longer need to stay here anymore. You can go back into the world. He says, I have chosen to work with these people, but you have chosen now to live in the world with others. So the young men came back to live in the world, but not caught up in the WHR a little bit. He was not a victim to the sleep state totally master of the cell. Now, we have to eat to fool ourselves in order to keep awake so they don't go to sleep because we think we're cheating them, right? Why do you eat? Maintenance. Hmm? <laughs> oh, good. Then, uh, uh, let's, let, let's look at some facts now. With it. Well, Oh, good. I, I, I loved it because I tell you, you, you're looking at the same facts again. Brother Jesus went and grew me on oxygen for 40 days and 40 nights. Right or wrong? Oh, fasting? What's that? Is that what you mean, 40 days and 40 nights? I said he grew me on oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> You call it fasting. <laughs> he was busy grooming on oxygen. And the very first test that even came on from his ego was to say, why are you wasting, why are you doing this? Why don't you chase these stones some bread and eat it? But it's the answer that makes it important as a science other than a philosophic condition. It's there we have the science. Man, this form of life or manifestation does not live or exist by bread alone. That's a label for minerals in a certain form. Alone. He didn't say we eat it. He said it doesn't live by it. Nobody lives by eating. If you did live by eating, you wouldn't go to the bathroom. You process certain substances with your mouth in order to have the experience of an ongoing illusion to make you feel capable of coping with the sleep state. But the sleep state isn't a valid condition. It's imposed upon your mechanism in a carbon body to work with. You are the oxygen already. What oxygen needs to sleep? But you don't know that. You're too busy calling yourself body, male, female. When the oxygen is already came in as a gift, working with the body, pull off all kinds of charades, only to let it down if it doesn't understand. Give it another chance. But when it understands, oxygen don't sleep. Then so when my friends try to put me into their uh, mind games, and I would sit back and let them fall asleep. Uh, I was watching their oxygen, how it was working in their bodies. <laughs> yes? Well, then people start to death because they believe they're going to start to death, and they hallucinate from lack of sleep because they believe that, right? And then remember what you just said. When you believe, you preset your program to your computer. And when you press replay, you only get what you put in. In other yeah. words, you can reprogram yourself. Correct. <laughs> That's your privilege. That's why Brother Jesus said, man don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the mouth of God is where the 
medulla oblongata or the sperm and ovum bonded inside of you to form the human body is called the hypothalamus and every doctor knows today that if you stick it with a pin you'd be dead instantly if you tickle it with a feather you'd be paralyzed for life and frequencies pass through it to make you function and move and they don't know how but they do know they can't monkey around with it now the acupuncturists know there's a certain depth they can stick it to make you talk and function if you're stuttering or stammering or you're dumb beyond that depth you'll be dead so between the two sides now we have zeroed in on man's capability to function within this mechanism sonically his medulla oblongata or hypothalamus is the link up with his voice so man doesn't live or his form doesn't live by eating and all you have to do is program well yes <laughs> well you mean well yes <laughs> yes or no yeah uh, people when they're sick and let's say give an example if i brought some food to you yesterday morning and you ate it and you felt sick at 10 o'clock and then at 12 o'clock you felt good and at quarter to one i brought you the same food would you eat knowing from the sensation you had a few hours before good now and i brought you the uh, food that in the evening the same food and you look at it would you eat good then all day today i did the same thing would you eat now you've already gone 48 hours without putting an object in your mouth. Well, how are you living on food? I might, but what is the body going to do? <laughs> <laughs> It'll partially appear to shut down to satisfy the illusion of your brain, but it has to shut down because you're not eating. It'll play that game. Then it'll uh, trick you to believe that you're dying. You gotta run to get something inside then it'll trick you that you didn't die because you didn't need anything in the first place and that's what you come out to find out that elderly people in homes don't eat as much and in fact some of them go for days without eating and they don't feel sick and there are people and i had to do it myself to prove that eating doesn't keep us alive years ago i used to weigh 180 pounds you know nice chubby little guy and i pizza pie oh no and i wanted to lose weight so i fasted for 28 days on water i lost 30 pounds and i tried to go further for the next 28 days and i get it all back look at that one i lost it for the first 28 days and then I get it all back the next 20 days without eating. So that taught me a good lesson. It wasn't eating that keeps me alive. And it isn't a fixation of ideas that keeps us alive. Laws of physics are here. They're working. They may not be understood. They may be classified as materialism by the uninformed. But this universe is not materialism. It's highly cosmic highly sacred highly divine though we don't understand it until we go through it so you can live without eating and they have a lot of case histories and i've done my own research in it the body is geared to live without eating The body is geared to live without eating. Yeah. What about liquid? Do you need water? No. Don't you have to have water? But it wouldn't make any difference because water has so much oxygen in it anyway that it's that's important. I mean, you cannot live without water, right? <coughs> Not true. Really? Really? Oh, 
Mm -hmm. I've done it. For how long? Twenty-eight days. And I put my weight on back. My weight came back in twenty-eight days, and at the end of fifty-six days, I, my body gained back the hundred and eighty pounds. And my doctor laughed at me and said, I told you, until you clean up your colon, you ain't gonna go nowhere. Why does a newborn then, why would a newborn die if it were deprived of milk? A newborn doesn't die if it's deprived of milk or anything. It's proving to the world it isn't living by eating. Nobody in this room lives by eating. You're programmed to believe you got to eat. And as long as you program you got to believe to eat, you're going to eat to pacify that sensation in your mechanism so that your body will appear to be strong to cope with the environment. But the newborn doesn't think. And so it doesn't have no programming. That's right. So and so Brother really Jesus was right when he said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. You know what the word is? Frequencies <coughs> surrounding your skin. You know that frequency? Now, if you were to try to imitate it with your voice, how would you, how would you imitate it? make a sound. Well, that, those frequencies, if I were to put a certain object in this room, it'll fall apart. It's been done already, so we know that nothing in this room or world exists by its shape other than the frequencies that are radiating. Ancient man have been doing it for centuries, and modern man is now catching up with mechanical devices. <coughs> Song waves hold your geometry together, and it has nothing to do with words. They are song waves, and they sound very strange to you. Some of them you recognize, and you think they're familiar to you, but they're important. I give you one song wave that may sound familiar to you, but you don't know what part of your anatomy is important. <coughs> don't sound much, right? You better have it if you're going to function in your esophagus, because we'll put a fiber microphone right there take the sound off and amplify it and compare it. But if you have a problem in your esophagus and you try to correct it, you can use various methods, but the fastest method is to get back the exact pitch that that organ makes to stay functional. And every modern scientist knows that today. They can send the beam right in there turn up the frequency for the esophagus and it corrects itself. So we're on the threshold of proving biblical writers knew what they were talking. Man is not a composition of food alone. He's a composition of sonic waves holding him together. And the biggest breakthrough is a heart transplant. You can transplant a heart to a patient and invariably he will die at 6 o'clock in the afternoon from a dialysis malfunction. His kidneys let him down. And the best heart <coughs> given would not match the man's body frequency. And until you can get that frequency to match the heart, the heart will be rejected by the body. Today we know it's a waste of time to go do tra transplants. We are going into the heart itself without taking it away from the body and implanting the actual breakdown where it is, putting in an implant to correct it, to let it work, utilizing its own frequencies. So we've already gone past the idea that this body is a machine. It's more. It's held together by frequencies, but we didn't know that technically. We assumed that Tradition came true for many cultures. 
beating drums and singing to make organ heal itself. It's a fact that when you take a drum and you beat it, the actual frequency that that drum is making may not be nice to you, it may be nice to some, others, no. But if once we can get the exact frequency and play it over the tissue that is broken down, it corrects itself. So the ancient man was beating his drum, boom, 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 boom. And I've been on that of those programs. And we, all I found that is a good exhaustion a seminar. But it works. Sound waves do have their potential condition and they work through the body to restore the balance. So to say the person needs to sleep, you ask an American Indian on a reservation, uh, what are you going to do? You sleep? You know, what? Sleep? That's for children. Come tonight to my uh, program and you're going to learn how not to sleep no more. And you go. And they all line up in a circle and they beat the drum. Boom, 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 boom. And no matter how you try, you can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and this can go on for days. This can go on for days and nights. Uh, everybody's walking out, what the heck, when did I need to sleep? I feel alive, alert. And you say, how many days were you there, Adana? Oh, four or five days. Uh, this is why it happens in the vortex, right? That you don't want to sleep, you wake up here, you just don't want to sleep. It's mm. the vibration. Your body is designed by vibration. And sleep is not... Your so when you think you need sleep, it's because you're still a passenger in your body. When you decide to be a driver, you will not want to sleep. You'll want to prove what is valid about your body. That's why we say many are called, a few are frozen. <laughs> many of us are, yeah. I'm not clear about what of the me of me moves on when I leave this body. Is it the breath? Is it a cylinder of electromagnetic energy? What? I'm not real clear about is it something tangible? <laughs> I mean, you know, if I want to manifest another way and I check out, what is it that checks out that's still alive? <laughs> French issue. You know, I mean, a dog, I'm taking a Frenchman. And in another language, it would mean that, but each one will have some way to say I. And each one will have some way to say they want to know what moves on when they stop breathing. But the language is their fixation. And that is what sets the frequency for the illusion in your body. Now, you heard me speak. I want to know what moves on when breath stops. Everyone in this room understand what I just said? Who understand? No, me, nothing to you. Won't register you. But if you're a Korean or standing there, you say, what's up, 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 He's going to answer in Korean, and you again wouldn't understand what the heck the two Vsas said. But then if I said, he said, nothing moves on. But in English, you'll still puzzle your head, what? 
moves on. And in actuality, nothing came in, nothing went out other than the opportunity to breed. But oxygen is the only gas in this entire cosmos that will produce a strange phenomenon on the 144 elements that make your body. Up. There's not a single element missing in the human body. Everyone from the environment is in you. You're a walking miniature universe. But oxygen is the only one that will produce a strange phenomenon in it. And that phenomenon is if that organism breathes it in, it becomes conscious. Now you understand the word conscious? I didn't say you become smart. I didn't say you become wise. I didn't say you become enlightened. You become conscious. And you trace every wise man in this world right down and they will tell you conscious can only be compared to a camera. When you're born and you breathe the air in, you're a biological TV camera. Nothing more, nothing less. And you're constantly looking around. But you're not talking because you're not a computer yet. They gotta program you to talk back that this is pencil, this is flower, grass, that's if your parents are speaking English. If your parents are speaking German, Chinese, or anything, that's what they can tell you how you function in that environment. But everyone born, no matter where they're born, and taken in the air, are all biological TV cameras right at that moment. Now that's what we require when we talk about meditation. Relive those memories printed in your mechanism to validate what you are, not who you are. You have to go back there to find out what really occurs in your cellular structure. And oxygen is the only gas that can do so. It can give you helium to make you conscious. It can give you nitrogen to make you conscious. And it can give you carbon dioxide but it can give you oxygen and it will make you what? Conscious. Now when you take it away from you, two things happen. You stop being conscious and you stop functioning. All right? Now where are you now before the oxygen came in to make you conscious? Think of that one before you say this. Moses had to confront his own mechanism, but he was afraid to write it down as he actually heard it. So he wrote a lot of things and left it to us to pursue. And he said he saw a burning bush. <laughs> it's right in your own head, you know. And then he heard his burning bush talking to him. That's his own principle of consciousness because he was breathing at the time. He was confronting what he was. Well, how can he go tell the people that this creative principle wants them to accept the responsibility of living their own life and standing on their own two feet? You think they'll do it? He had to find some excuse, some way to trigger it. And creative intelligence gave him the idea. I am that I am is what he wrote and that's what he said. But he couldn't go tell the people like that, I am sent him. You think if you were a Jewish person living in that time, would you accept I am sent Moses to tell you to get out of Egypt? You wouldn't. You think he's crazy, right? I would think he's crazy. But if he came and told me, Jehovah sent me, oh boy, who is he? the great power in the universe, then I'll have to accept because 
Brother Moses is saying, here I got everything to prove. Well, when we look deep down into the reality of what he did write, we find out that he wrote a very fantastic science in a few letters of the translated today, leaving us wondering. can delude itself with this word. <coughs> this one never goes off with this word. And yet the both eye are there facing us every second up your right nostril and down your left nostril. In your mechanism you are living inhalation and exhalation. And every time you inhale you say what? I am. And when you exhale and you don't come back in, you go panic, right? But you're hoping it comes back in because you're in the on state and not in the off state when it went out. If you don't come back, you're in the off state and they call you a breath free. If it comes back in, you're in the on state like an automobile turned on in the ignition going and you're running. And so, breathless keeps you functioning and breath-free put you back in the dirt. So remove your shoes, Moses. You're standing on me, you know. <laughs> me who? Dirt? No, man. Living soil. Cosmic elements. So Moses had to take off his shoe to respect the very atom structure that he's standing on. When you realize what we're talking about in meditation, you will have the valid truth that the very ground you walk on is your own cellular structure in another frequency. God has already become this universe, but it's up to us to validate it for ourselves. No one can do it for us. That's the funny joke about it. That's why we say God is a joker. Life would be boring if no jokes. <laughs> so that's the reason why it becomes sacred and it's joking at the same time. It makes us appreciate. When we start to narrow it down to see what it is and then to work with it, we begin to appreciate it more. The on state of the I, Eastern men call existence, consciousness. And the continuation of the on state, they call anandam, bliss. So if they were going to describe God to you, they will tell you existence, consciousness, bliss. Now you can't say existence is positive or negative. You can't say it's male or female. Consciousness, you can't say it's intelligence. And you can't say it's a enlightenment, but has to be there to exist. And what you'll get out of consciousness when you recognize that you exist in it, ananda, which they call bliss. The Greek says, God is love in two forms. The first form they call it agape. And the other one is Eros, starting to rotten, if you muck it up. So they divide it up as to say, we can <coughs> exist in full consciousness, either in a state of agape or erratic. And if you want to be a little more comical, erratic. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> the, the funny part of it is on state will never go off. 
And we use words like infinity, eternity, immortal for the on state. And we live with the idea that when we die, <laughs> we're going to go to God and ask him for what? Immortality? Or he already gives you the immortality, you don't recognize it. You've got it already inside of you. But <clears throat> it's to know which role to play, the passenger or the driver. I can't drive the car for you. I can't breathe for you. But I can make you conscious that you have the choice to be a passenger or a driver with your beautiful vehicle. Ancient man may call it the temple. Build me a temple that I may dwell in it. How are you going to dwell? In an off state or a non state? And if it dwells inside of this temple, it must provide an illusion for the temple to have a feeling of individuality. So we are stuck in science by saying unified feel and relative feel. In the Western world and in the Eastern world it's called cosmology and maya. Maya is the illusion and the cosmology is the unity of the illusion. And the realized person who understands it today to represent the bonding of the sperm and the ovum. And the moment it occurred is 4th of July, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It ain't quitting. Imagine you experience 4th of July sitting down in the first stage of your enlightenment. All around you is 4th of July, like firecrackers. You ever look at the TV set when you turn it on without any station? That's exactly what you will see when you arrive at that state. But you wouldn't see any geometry even when you're sitting down in it. Until you set up resonance or residence. <laughs> and that's where you have to say, what am I? Where am I? Well, it's like, who's in first, what's in second, and I don't know who's in third. <laughs> so your brain is going to pull you very back fast to your center of the true I in you. And you'll realize, like Jesus would say, I and the Father are one, and I of myself can do nothing, but the Father in me moves this cellular form and allows me to now get up off the floor or the chair and walk in the 4th of July in full confidence, knowing I can trust everything not to collapse by my eyes. So when I look at you, I have two choices, to see you as or see true. And if I see true, you're not hearing. You're just like a TV set. But I walk, I have to function in it. And that's the requirement. I can't sit down and do it. In the Eastern tradition, they call it the immobile state or the tranquilized state or samadhi. A way of knowing the truth of what you are in a non-moving state. But you are no asset until you get up to function. So that's why Jesus and all the men say, pick up your cross and follow me. You have to take up this body, though it appears as atoms, having no density to trust, and yet trust for the first time that the God that put it together will allow you to feel the object as solid in as much as look nebulous with your eyes. And for the first seven and a half minutes, you can think you're really crazy. So crazy that you may think you're schizophrenic. And the next seven and a half minutes, you think you're lost into oblivion. And the saints used to call that night of the soul. <laughs> it's more miserable than night of the soul. 
Everybody knows what a nightmare is. Wait till you find out what a night stalin is. <laughs> then you really get down into oblivion to come out. And then if you do stick it out, don't panic. That's the whole rule of the game. Don't panic, don't fall asleep. Then you're doing exactly as required by all the other masters. You make it to the threshold pair. Hmm. It's solid, but it's, uh, it's still uh, 4th of July. You can trust it, Adaro. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Everything is transparent, and yet everything is... Oh, yeah, you got blonde dress. Yeah. Hmm. Blue shirt. But then you look at it, the whole thing, it looks like you're looking through the glass. Kind of freak you out after a while. But you got to live with it. So they call that Nirbhikalpa Samadhi, or God awareness in the mobile state. Now, Jesus mastered that in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, gourmeting on oxygen. Then he decided, well, what the heck, who wants to stay in the desert? And no fun. Let's go back to the city. So he got up and he came back. That's what you call the mobile state. Going back into the world but not coughing up in the world of it. But you know something? He went to a wedding. That's a strange thing. Coming from the desert, not eating, to go to a place where everybody's eating. And then his mother's going to meet him and says, we got no wine. But it's the answer that freaks us out. Freaks us out. My time ain't come. You remember that statement? My time ain't come. And he wouldn't do nothing for her till the right time. That is to tell us how this body works. We are always in a hurry to do something for somebody only to find out we ain't doing nothing. But when you know how your mechanism is set up to work, it'll amaze you that you didn't do a single thing to bring about a manifestation in their life. <coughs> and all the miracles that you read about are available to you, but you don't do them. They occur because you're present. And that's the funny joke about it, because I of myself can do nothing, but the Father in me do it everything. <coughs> So when he was asked to make wine, he told her his time didn't come. <coughs> and when she went off and told the people, do what he tells you, do what he tells you. Then when the time came for him to signal, okay, put the water in there, go give that guy over there. And to her amazement, they see wine. Now, he didn't tell you when he was in the body that you couldn't do it. He said, the things I do, you can do also. And he didn't put up the fact that you couldn't be better than him by saying, I'm not greater than me. Right? He never said that. He said, and greater things shall you do. Telling you right away, he's not the only son of God or realized being on the planetary system. You and him and everyone who is willing to accept your reality within yourself have a right to express the greatness of God locked up in you at the right moment you're supposed to express it. But we'll always feel frustrated, incompetent, unworthy, because we're set up to evolve from one year to a hundred, not from a hundred to one. Now if you're coming from a hundred to one, you wouldn't worry about it. But because you're coming from one to a hundred, you don't feel worthy or anything. But he's not asking us to feel worthy or unworthy. He's asking us, like all the others are asking us, accept what you are, not who you are. And the only way you can validate that for yourself is to go up the journey internally. And it can only be done by one process, not a goal, called meditation. Prayer is not meditation. The sperm didn't pray to get to the ovum. <laughs> it's the ovum that sent the signal to the sperm. This is ovum 149, calling sperm 149, calling sperm 149. 
And he better come in too, otherwise they ain't gonna bond. And if ever you can get that tape, my friend, The Miracle of Life, where they show the entire research program, the ovum decides, the frequencies are all set up, the bonding. We know today, nobody is born haphazardly, incorrectly. They're all set up by laws of physics, but they're cosmic laws in a generalized term of the church, it's called truth, what you are. It gives you a better appreciation for the cosmic temple. No one knock it. When you master it, you have two choices. You can look old fashioned to satisfy those who recognize you as some person, or you can turn on your brand new skin. Remember, the snake does it. <laughs> and you're entitled. The salamander does it, and you're entitled. But that's, again, the laws inside of you. The things I do, you do also are valid, because you have the right. But when you understand it, when you don't understand it, then you, belief is the next step. But that's like a student, that's like a passenger. He'll tell you how to drive the car, but he'll never get behind the wheel. You ever had that problem? Passenger drivers or backseat drivers, they're very good. Once in a while, <laughs> when they find a blind spot. But that's what we're talking about. When you decide in your consciousness, to take over and drive your own vehicle. You're in control. So, when you go home and you sit down and you reflect on what you have, nobody can take away your opportunity to make contact inside of yourself. universe is open to you. And to him that overcome it, I will not send for the second time, but I'll make him a pillar in the house of the Lord. Your own I am will provide the opportunity for you to overcome the sleep state to find out for sure if you can cope with it. And if you don't cope with it, it'll provide you another opportunity to try again. So, we never left out, and there's no hell to go to. <laughs> and heaven is right here at your nose. <laughs> so, you have all the world and all the time to do it. Thank you. I want to make one more comment. When you face yourself, within yourself, <coughs> you'll find that you're not catering to a belief system. You're actually confronting the laws of the universe. And that's the highest religion, truth, 